Mr. Takashi. Halo Mr. Takashi. Good day, Professor Takashi. Okay. Can you hear us? Hello, good day, Professor Takashi. Kamu enggak enggak kedengeran juga? Udah, aku udah sini. Today, Professor Takashi, can you hear us? Um, we don't seem to be able to hear you here, Minton. Can you hear? Yes, I can Professor hear you, Takashi? but we can't hear your voice, Mr. Takashi. Oh, okay. Yeah. What seems to be the problem then? Ah, okay. Unmute. But I think he is unmuted already. Not me. Hello, Professor Takashi. Hello, Professor Takashi. Good day, Professor Takashi. Can you hear us? Uh, we don't seem to be able to hear you here. Maybe you can unmute your microphone here. I think he is speaking, but we cannot hear him. Okay, good day. Minton? Yeah. Um, okay. We cannot hear your voice, Mr. Takas. Uh, we can just chat. Okay, um, maybe he's changing his device. That close again. That close, yeah. Hello, hello. Okay, uh, good, good morning, okay. good day, uh, Professor Takashi. Yeah, can you hear right. me? Yes, uh, okay, I can, okay. clearly. Okay. So can okay. you hear us here? Yeah, okay, good. All right, thank you. So we then should we start? Yeah. Okay. Minton kan ini. Minton kita ni. Minton Lanjut aja mbak. Okay, langsung start. Uh, all right. So, um, good morning everyone. Good morning, Professor Takashi, or maybe if I say good afternoon, because I suppose it's 11 a.m. there, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, on behalf of Book for Us, I would like to extend our warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for mm -hmm, joining us yeah. today. Okay, so thank you for taking the time of your schedule to join mm -hmm. us today. Um, so, uh, yeah. My name is Nama Pawestri and today mm -hmm. I will serve as the host for this session. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after two previous literacy discussion before with uh, writer Agustinus Wibowo and senior journalist Jesse Anwar, Book mm -hmm. for Us come back again with its initiative on another book talk and literacy discussion. Mm -hmm. This time with a very special speaker, 
Okay, so if any of you attendees here have been uh, or have ever read one of the classic historical book entitled An Age in Motion, Popular Radicalism in Java, 1912 to uh, 1926, uh, which was awarded the Ohira Masayoshi Asia Pacific Awards, then you all are in a trip today because we are luckily able to have the writer of the book, uh, Professor Takashi Shiraisi, with us today. Thank you, Professor Takashi. Mm, thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Professor Takashi Shiraisi is going to give us his recommendation on books to read. And if you attendees here have any question later on, then you can um, type or write your questions in the chat box. And we're going to read it uh, top down, okay? Um, if you can, okay, please write your question in English. But if you feel like having difficulties in doing so, you can write it in Indonesian language or in Bahasa Indonesia, and mm -hmm. we will help you with the translation letter. Okay, is that no, okay? No, it's okay. Mr. I understand yeah. Bahasa. So ah, okay, okay. That's uh -huh, no problem. That's better. Okay, then. Okay, Good. yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, tell me how to proceed. Okay. I mean, how to go about uh, this, this seminar or whatever talk. All right. Yeah, so, uh, Professor, as previously mentioned before, book for us is a community and a site aimed to share book reviews for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the website basically accepts any book reviews and manuscript. And uh, this community actually also conduct a series of event of literacy discussion and interviews with authors, experts, and public mm -hmm. speakers. So mm -hmm. we ask them to give recommendation on the book, okay, that they would recommend to us here, okay, to actually like promote literacy discussion and to, to kind of give us inspiration about books to read, basically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we expect oh, to get a recommendation of books from you actually today. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, um, let me thank all of you for inviting me. Um, the book uh, uh, Bunoma mentioned is a book uh, which I published uh, how many years ago? 31 years ago, 32 years yeah. ago. <laughs> uh, and actually the original dissertation on which the book was based was already written in 1982, so almost 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, probably in a week, the sequel to that book, An Age of oh. the, the sequel is titled The Phantom World of Digo. So, I mean, actually part of, uh, I mean, actually it has six chapters and three, mm -hmm. the, the first three chapters are already translated into Bahasa okay. uh, with uh, the title uh, Hantu Digo. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you know, uh, in a week, uh, you can actually take a look at my uh, sequel to An Age in Motion with the title ah. The Phantom World of Digo, mm -hmm. uh, which actually sort of complete my work on the Indonesian uh, politics as okay. well as policing uh, under the Dutch uh, colonial rule. Oh. Uh, so what I would probably uh, talk about briefly uh, as a kind of introduction uh, to our discussion is what books, as you sort of you know, suggested, mm -hmm. what books uh, looking back, I find uh, most useful or the kind yeah. of book you should read uh, in Indonesian studies. And then I briefly talk about other books, which are more yeah. sort of I chose randomly, but uh, with the hope that uh, if you read those books, then you may start asking new questions about uh, Indonesian history and yeah. politics. So, um, the, the five books I, I mentioned um, uh, for Indonesian studies is Ben Anderson's Java in a Time of Revolution. Yeah, so... Yeah, and then um, the um, Ruth McVeigh's The Rise of Indonesian Communism, uh, and then Ong Ho Khan's um, the inscrutables and the paranoid, 
and then uh, James Siegel's uh, solo uh, in the new order. In the new order, and then finally uh, Oliver Walters' history, culture, and region in Southeast Asian perspectives. I mean, uh, probably many of you have already read uh, at least some of those books. I mean, Anderson, of course, is very well known. He is probably, uh, even though he is now, you know, uh, I mean, gone, um, the late Ben was a student of mine, and um, he was a big star in social science and humanities already in the 1980s, mainly because of his another book, Imagined Communities, or Communitas Turbayankan, I guess. Um, but uh, I'm always convinced that the book, which is based on the most thoroughly researched work, is his Java in the Time of Revolution. And if you read books on Indonesia, I mean history books on Indonesia, especially published in the 1980s and 90s, uh, long, long ago, you know, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it's before you were born, um, many of the books are inspired uh, by Ben's Java Especially, there is a chapter there on social revolutions, and uh, and therefore uh, he actually provided uh, in his book, in addition to the notion of pumuda, which was a kind of you know energy, which uh, who were, which worked as an engine of revolution. But at the same time, actually, he made the point that this energy manifested itself in many different ways and in a number of cases such as uh, Tigadaira, uh, Banten and also Solo I mean, manifested itself in social revolution. And so actually, you know, many actually historians of, of my generation sort of asked, you know, I mean, what was it that actually drove social revolution, I mean, what kind of forces are there? And to be honest, actually, I myself initially wanted to do a kind of comparison uh, during the revolutionary years between Solo and Jokja. I mean, Solo was very revolutionary, sort of, you know, from 1960, uh, 45 to maybe 48, while Jogja was a center of the Republic of Indonesia, capital, and of course the government made sure there will be no social revolution. So that comparison uh, looked very interesting. Uh, and also, I mean, uh, Ben Anderson's teacher, I mean, George Cahin, uh, with whom I also worked, suggested that if you put solo Jokja uh, comparison in a longer perspective, actually there are very different local military development. Um, and there was a division called uh, DBC Senopati, which was based in solo, but it more or less collapsed. Uh, in Madiun affair, right? So, so in that sense, you know, I mean, actually, solo Jokja comparison would be very useful and provide a number of different perspective. I mean, a very good perspective on number of very interesting issues from the revolutionary period to maybe 1965, 66, 67. So actually, the um, Ben's, you know, Jabba was probably the book which really triggered me, I mean, encouraged me, inspired me um, to look at Solo. But by accident, I encountered with Hajmisbas uh, Islamism than Communism, 
uh, in Majala Madame Muslimin uh, in museum uh, in Jakarta. And so, you know, I mean, instead of working on the revolutionary period, I decided to go back earlier uh, of Indonesian history in the 1910s and 20s. And then the, the classic is Ruth McVeigh's The Rise of Indonesian Communism. I mean, actually, three years ago, I had a chance to reread her book, and this is really great. I mean, if you are ever interested in doing history uh, of the Prograkan in the 1910s and 20s, who want to look at the history of communism uh, in Indonesia or more broadly in Southeast Asia, this is the book you should start with. And this is so thoroughly researched. And uh, even now, you know, I mean, actually, I, I can't think of any other book which can surpass this work on this topic. Uh, this is a model for history work. And I'm not sure whether there are people, uh, whether outside Indonesia or even in, in inside Indonesia who actually read On Ho Kam. But uh, On Ho Kam's dissertation, which he completed under uh, historian Harry J. Bender and uh, at Yale, uh, is a marvelous dissertation. I mean, uh, frankly, I don't remember the title, but it's a social history of Madiun in the 19th century. And when you probably, you know, I mean, actually, the, my generation of historians or social scientists think about Java in the 19th century, the first book probably we read is Clifford Geert's Agricultural Involution. Uh, but On Ho Kam, in this book, more or less debunked the argument uh, Clifford Geert makes about agricultural involution. And also, he pointed out the enormous importance of people variously called, like Jago, Very, and so on, and these are, in fact, crucial in connecting the world of Bansawan, or aristocrats, and the peasant world. And so in that sense, you know, I mean, actually, I really strongly recommend you to look at this work, because this is, after all, Indonesian's work, and it is one of the very few which actually relied on Javanese text to understand social history. There are a lot of works done by non-Indonesians on literature and cultural history based on Javanese texts. But as far as I can tell, On Ho Kam is probably the historian who used Javanese texts best for social history. And Jim Siegel, I mean, he is very prolific. Uh, he produced quite a number of books. And I like this book, uh, Solo in the New Order, mainly because, I mean, he actually uh, connected, I mean, pointed out the crucial connection between language, in his case, Bahasa Java, uh, Java and the social order. I mean, I mean, probably if uh, you think if you are or in Java, uh, it would be very difficult. I mean, uh, it would be very easy for you to understand. You know, I mean, for example, if you talk to somebody higher in status, it will be very difficult to say to talk in Moko, right? <laughs> so, I mean, th that kind of thing, I mean, the language actually itself has disciplinary 
um, power on the body is actually there and his probably in the most important insight is Solo's social order under President Sahauto uh, in the new order was at the bottom built on language itself. Um, and um, I'm not sure whether you can notice or not, uh, I actually got inspired by his insight when I was writing my dissertation uh, uh, back in the early 1980s. And finally, Walter's uh, history, culture, and region in Southeast Asia is not exactly about Indonesia, but rather how to think about the political system in Southeast Asia. And he used the word mandala. And mandala is a kind of network. And, you know, I mean, uh, each Nuguri or Nugara or whatever is actually a dot. And again, if you think about the traditional state uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, one of the books that comes or come to my mind is Clifford Geert's Nugara. And it's about Bali. And he basically argues that, you know, Nugara is a ritual of state. But I think it's a kind of anthropologist fantasy. And however it is called, Nugara or state or political system or whatever, I mean, they have their own business to do. And that is controlling the people and mobilizing resources. And Waters basically pointed out that if we want to understand quote-unquote state in Southeast Asia, we better think as a network of mandalas. And it's a big insight. And he and pointed out that depending on Dampo, Hot Foods, and China, the commerce or trade strongly affects port, port city states, sources, Taram. Uh, actually, you know, might no longer be dominant on coastal port cities and so on. So, actually, Mandala is a key to understand the kind of dynamics in Southeast Asia. So, I would say these five are the starters for you to read on um, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. And I would add plus. Jim Siegel, uh, not Siegel, uh, Jim Rush, Opium to Java. Um, James Rush also is a student, I think, is Harry J. Bender. And uh, their student ears, and, uh, and his student ears uh, overlapped, I, I believe, with Ong Ho Kam. And I'm pretty sure they talked. Um, Ong Ho Kam's notion of, you know, Jago, very, and so on, are crucial to understand how opium farms were operated uh, in Java in the 19th century. Uh, but at the same time, I really love this book, mainly because this actually provided me to compare the 19th century Dutch Indies state with, for example, very embryonic Singaporean state or Siamese state, because all these countries used opium firms as a major source of resources. And so these are the books, you know, I mean, uh, I would recommend. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are other books, but uh, when um, you guys got in touch with me, I kind of, you know, I mean, thought about it, and then these six books uh, just came to my mind. Can I continue, or...? I can't hear you. 
Kejut. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alright. So maybe we can have a little bit of discussion at the first topic okay. about Indonesian studies first, and then later on we can continue with the next um, later five books. Okay. Um. So um. Yeah, that was such an interesting and prolific recommendations um, about the starters that we can uh, refer on when we try to, you know, start our study in Indonesian studies and uh, Southeast Asian studies. So I have a little bit of questions for you, Professor Takashi. Yeah. Um, so one of the books that you would recommend here uh, would be The Rise of Indonesian Communism from Ruth McFay, right? And you yourself has written uh, the book, uh, or as we call it here, Zaman Bergerak, which, you know, we also talk about the story of Indonesian communism. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, uh, when you see the, the story of Indonesian communism or the communism in the Indonesian context, what are the specific traits or characteristics that you think is, you know, uniquely and distinctively Indonesian, like if you compare it to other countries? Well, I mean, actually, um, that is not the way neither Ruth mm -hmm. nor I look at uh, this history. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of Ruth McBay, mm -hmm. I think the most important point she wanted to make is the Communist Revolt in 1926-27, Mm -hmm. wasn't based on the Comintern direction, but rather it was an outcome of local developments. Mm -hmm. And he traced the history of Indonesian Communist Party. And therefore, and I mean, who shaped the history of the first generation of Indonesian Communist Party and why it ended up uh, with a revolt and so on. I think that is the single most important question okay. she asked. In my case, I was never interested in Indonesian communism itself. I was more interested, far more interested in Prograkan. I mean, what okay. is it? What is it? And my argument is, in fact, I mean, people actually started to, for example, publish newspapers, mm -hmm. organize, you know, I mean, meetings, and started to use the kind of language they had never used before. And that actually made Indonesians look at the world differently. And this new consciousness sort of manifested itself in many different forms. Uh, so, and uh, the political movement, including communist movement, was only one of them. I mean, you can talk in the same breath about newspapers, boycotts, uh, strikes, and you know schools i mean education and so on so it's actually very much depends on the questions but neither of us were that much interested in comparing indonesian communist communism or prograkan with other countries histories okay um yeah thank you and my second question, if I may, would be that uh, one of the books that you recommend here would be the Solo in the New Order, Language and Hierarchy in an Indonesian City by James Siegel, right? Mm -hmm. So when I first hear the title of this book, I would wonder if this is like a sociolinguistic book, actually. So I had a little bit of interest in linguistic, uh, personally. So um, in your opinion, okay, to what extent Okay, or in what way do you think a linguistic approach or particularly social linguistic approach can be utilized or can be complementary in historical studies? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, I mean, the linguistics uh, is important, but in this case, I think the inspiration 
came probably by uh, works like Michel mm -hmm. Foucault. Okay. Uh, so not exactly linguistics, but, ra mm -hmm. but rather a new sort of way of looking at disciplining mm -hmm. people and their body. And, uh, and actually, um, language is quite crucial mm. to understand how people behave as they, they do, right? And uh, I think, you know, that's the whole point. And nice thing about Jim Siegel's work is he's so thoroughly informed theoretically, especially French uh, schools. I mean, uh, Jack Derrida, uh, Foucault, and so on. And therefore, even though you are not, I mean, I'm, I'm for example, not interested in you know, French schools at all, but via uh, Jim Siegel's works, I ended up reading quite a lot of them. So, so in that sense, you know, I mean, actually, you know, his, his work is a very nice bridge to uh, more sort of, you know, quote-unquote theoretical. Mm -hmm. But, you know, don't misunderstand. Theoretical is better than, you know, more tangible works. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I rather prefer more tangible his history works than, you know, I mean, somewhere in the air. But, I mean, actually, Jim Siegel's work is very different from other works, uh, which are more firmly grounded in history. I mean, of course, Jim Siegel, Jim, Jim Siegel spent a year in Solo doing field research. Uh, it's actually near Kauman, and it's, 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 it's actually a quite nice place. I mean, interesting place. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, but do you like to confirm something to the audience here? Can you see the slide? I actually yeah. put this okay. Yeah. So, um, if I may, then we can continue to the next uh, five latest book. So this one would be more about uh, political and social studies, right? So you've yeah. given us uh, some of this book list, okay, prior to these meetings. So maybe well, you can talk yeah. a little bit again about these yeah. books. Okay, okay. Um, first of all, Perry Anderson, Lineages of the Absolutist State. Mm -hmm. Perry Anderson is a younger brother of Ben Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, but very different type of scholar. Mm -hmm. And I love this book, and I read the book probably more than 30 years ago. And, but uh, I actually kept this book uh, somewhere in my bookshelf, mainly because this will be a model if I ever write a kind of comparative history of colonial states in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I briefly talked about the importance of opium firms, uh, as um, you know, um, um, James Rush sort of, you know, uh, his work showed uh, in Opium to Java. But, uh, and, and actually, if you look at the modern colonial state formation in Southeast Asia, it really happened in the 19th century, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I mean, actually, but interesting thing, you know, I mean, for example, uh, Malaya and uh, Strait Settlements states were built by the British. Burma was also built by the British as part of the British Indian Empire. And then India Blanda was built by the Dutch. Uh, Spanish Philippines was built by the Spaniards, but then taken over by the Americans. And so, actually, the, the kind of, you know, state builders were different. And, of course, local conditions are different. But quite often, they actually looked at each other. And so I thought that, you know, I mean, actually a kind of comparative history of colonial state building, or for that matter, actually nation state building after, you know, independence, uh, a very interesting research project. And I, but, you know, I'm now 
too old to start a new project. So I hope that some of you take a look at this book and you know start asking. That is the reason I mentioned uh, listed this book. Mm -hmm. The second one is more sort of you know uh, narrowly focused on. American politics. I mean, and I intentionally mentioned this book because when you talk about Indonesian politics, most of the time you look at presidency. Right? Mm. <laughs> I mean, and you know, I mean, in a sense, it's quite natural. But um, everybody has 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and. Presidents have to rely on many other peoples, and this inner circle dynamics are crucial to understand policy making and all decision making. And I actually uh, interviewed some of your former presidents and mm -hmm. quite a number of ministers, as well as you know, I mean. Uh, military officers and so on, but I wonder whether there are historians who really look at the way in which, for example, Habibi made all the important decisions. I mean, he he made a number of very important decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh, you know, I mean, uh, oh, for that matter, you know, I mean, how. Uh, President Jokowi is handling the current COVID crisis in competition with all the governors and so on. And, you know, I mean, what is a decision-making process? And, you know, what he is aware of, capable of doing, and which he's, uh, he knows he cannot do and so on. So, actually, this is, again, something which I hope somebody will do uh, in the future. The third question is actually, this is an interesting book in itself. The, it's, this is a history of uh, American-China policy. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, now the US-China relationship is turning ugly. Uh, but um, he looks at quite a number of policy makers and their interactions and something similar can again I hope be written about Indonesia and the Volker uh, William Silver's Volker is a bit different uh, actually over the last 10 years I'm, I have been sort of mainly working on the East Asia, East Asia meaning uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, uh, as well as Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. And if you look at the history of East Asia in the 1980s and 90s, um, American macroeconomic policy, especially monetary policy, is crucial. I mean, uh, for example, Volcker was appointed uh, Federal Reserve Board Chairman in 1979, and then he immediately jacked up interest rate. And then, you know, in the Philippines, President Marcos got into trouble. So actually, uh, normally, you know, I mean, when we look at the kind of regional or international relations uh, the regional politics or international relations, it's easy to notice all the geopolitical maneuvers. But quite often, macroeconomic context is lost. And in that sense, I strongly recommend uh, people uh, look at, you know, at least some of the works on macroeconomic policy. And you can easily imagine writing something about, say, uh, Buani mm -hmm. on this <laughs> in the future. And finally, Scotch Power, this is actually again a favorite. I mean, which I read 
when I was still a graduate student. Uh, but, you know, I mean, um, this is, I mean, uh, this is one of the books I read in connection with Ben's Java in a Time of Revolution. And his her take on social revolution is so different. I mean, in the case of, you know, Ben Anderson's Java, he doesn't really go into any class analysis uh, in uh, analyzing the Indonesian revolution, uh, especially 1945-46, for right reasons. Because, you know, I mean, uh, class element was there, but not crucial. It was more the collapse mm -hmm. of the state apparatus itself and also the, the presence of quite a, uh, many sort of young Indonesians, at least trained militarily by the Japanese army. Um, but in the case of Scotch Paul, he actually very she, uh, actually quite systematically looked at the state and revolution uh, in the case of China and Russia. And these are very useful to think about uh, revolutions, uh, not only Indonesian revolutions, but revolutions in other countries in Southeast Asia. So these are the, and, but you know, I mean, uh, again, I'm not sort of, you know, I, I have, I haven't, I mean, I didn't list those books mm -hmm. because they are the best books, but rather, <laughs> I listed, I mean, part of the books because I, yes. I really love those books. Yes. And part of the books, especially the In the Shadow of the Oval Office and uh, About Face and Volker, these are the books which I hope someone read and then start questions similar to their questions about Indonesia. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. So that was such a fruitful and inspirative uh, recommendation for us to read. And I'm curious about something actually, Professor. So you pretty much mentioned um, several books on political and social studies on America and China here, right? Mm -hmm. So me being an Indonesian, um, you know, specifically and Southeast Asian generally, um, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes, you know, we are in the middle of these two powerful countries, China and you know, the USA, who try to win an influence on us, the Southeast Asian country, given mm -hmm. that um, the Asian economic community nowadays, we, we are becoming mm -hmm. one of the biggest world market, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on this? Uh, which country do you think would have more opportunity to win? Indonesia, particularly? Um, well, I mean, actually, it's not um, one way or another. I mean, actually, um, probably, uh, I don't want to, you know, I mean, uh, publicize my own works. But, uh, but recently, um, one, of, one of my books, uh, which was originally published in Japanese in 2015, uh, was translated into English, is now available. Uh, the title is Maritime Asia versus Mainland, I mean Continental Asia. And the argument is the suddenly, I mean, uh, I'm still looking at, you know, I mean, Obama period, okay. um, because, you know, it was published in 2015, but, you know, I'm basically looking at uh, President Obama's policy, Xi Jinping's policy, and Mr. Abe and then Southeast Asia. And um, my guess is, I mean, maybe there are three points uh, I would underline here. One is, you know, I mean, unfortunately, ASEAN is drifting, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in the first decade of the 21st century, ASEAN was crucial for regional architecture. I mean, as you have ASEAN plus, uh, plus one, ASEAN yeah. three, ASEAN plus six, and the East Asia Summit, and so on, right? Yeah. But, and they are still being held, but uh, these days, I mean, actually, you notice more divisions mm -hmm. 
and uh, and if you ask, uh, the answers are pretty simple. But anyway, you know, ASEAN is drifting. That is number one. Okay. Number two. Once, you know, I mean, ASEAN itself is uh, getting less important, certainly outside uh, powers would tend to engage more individual countries. Mm -hmm. And there are two groups of countries which are actually important. One is those countries, territorial conflicts, or conflicts in uh, exclusive economic zone uh, mm -hmm. with China. And that means actually and want to hide behind other countries. Those countries who are now uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, and to a lesser extent, Indonesia. So actually, we need to look at these countries very carefully and engage. The other, the, um, if you look at mainland Southeast Asia, now unfortunately all the states are authoritarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, might argue they are democratic, but you know, I don't think so. Um, and, and yet, some of the countries, like Thailand and Myanmar, go democratic. They change the geopolitical and geoeconomic conditions yeah. of Southeast Asia. So, I mean, I'm actually looking at these two things more closely these days. Yeah. All right. So, thank you. And um, we're really looking forward to it off the edition mm -hmm. of your newest book, actually. So, thank you, Professor okay. Takashi. Uh, before we proceed to the Q&A sessions, um, Winton, maybe you want to have anything to say? Mm -hmm. Or you want to ask something? Hi, Erwinton. Yeah, hello. Okay, uh, thank you. Mbak. So, Mr. Takashi, I'm Erwinton. I mean, I was inviting you a few days ago. Thank okay, hi. For your opportunity. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Kepada teman-teman uh, atau ibu bapak yang hadir di sini, jadi uh, saya dan beberapa teman tuh membuat sebuah kayak platform fokus ke soal buku. Mungkin teman-teman bapak-bapak yang tertarik untuk menulis di sana, uh, saya sangat mengapresiasi. Memang tidak ada bayaran, tapi hanya sekedar berbagi begitu. Dan kita berencana untuk wawancara tokoh publik karena beberapa minggu lalu kita wawancara ada Agustinus Wibowo dan Desi Anwar dan sekarang giliran Pak Takasi. Mungkin begitu. Terima kasih. Right, thank you. Thank you. Eh, oh. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if any of you tennis you would like to send your book review, you can send it to book for us. Okay, so um, I guess now we can proceed to the Q&A session. We, we have uh, quite some question here. Okay, first one would be from uh, Mr. Cory Bayina Turoshi. Hi. Hello, Bapak atau Ibu Cory? Okay. Yeah. Hello, hello. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. 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 Yeah. So, um, Mr. Takashi, um, yeah. he asks that from the books of recommendation, Professor Sirashi has said, it seems that the book studies are mostly Java centric. Yeah. How, according to Professor Sirashi, this book can give a perspective on studies outside Java? And the second one, according to Professor Shiraisi, are these books still relevant in understanding and explaining the contemporary condition of Indonesia in general today? Give me my uh, Daman Burgurak. Yeah. And, uh, oh, well, I mean, the, the book that you recommend, actually. Huh? Um, the book that you recommend, um, it seems that the book studies are mostly Java-centric. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, I mean, I'm more interested in Java. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, actually, of course, you know, there are other people 
uh, who worked on you know other areas of Indonesia. And uh, if you're interested, you know, look at other people's works. Uh, but my actually position, and that is a reason I really focused on Java, is because. Mm -hmm. Java, I mean, uh, this you know, Indonesian state actually started its life in Java, you know, as a Kini company state in the early 17th century, and it actually expanded over the last, you know, 400 years, right? And so I thought that, you know, I mean, Java is a place uh, I should look at. But, you know, I mean, for example, if you look at, I mean, uh, for example, um, Audrey Cahin's work, I mean, she looks at uh, West Sumatra uh, very comprehensively. So, I mean, I'm very much aware that there are different manifestations of political life in other places. Uh, but it's your decision which area and which people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, according to Professor Siraishi, are these books still relevant in understanding and explaining the contemporary condition of Indonesia in general? Uh, well, I mean, actually, you know, I mean, uh, Daman Burgurak is basically about 1910s and 20s. Um, <laughs> and uh, now many conditions are different. Uh, mm -hmm. But at least, uh, actually, you know, I mean, uh, when you, I'm not sure in the case of Indonesia, uh, but, you know, for example, in China, I mean, Chinese government officials will always talk about history, right? And <laughs> history is always a part of leg legitimacy um, creation. And so in that sense, you know, I mean, actually, even though the first generation of Prograkan is not being mentioned very often, certainly, I mean, once you move into the second generation, I mean, generation of, you know, Sukarno, Hatta, Capriol and so on. I mean, these people are still sort of seen as, you know, founding fathers mm -hmm. and mothers of, of Indonesia. And, you know, I mean, it's certainly, they look quite different if you look at them very carefully when they are young, uh, in their 20s. So <laughs> I guess, you know, I mean, uh, I wouldn't argue that my book itself uh, it's very relevant, but I mean, history is relevant in general. All right, thank you. So, um, next one we have a question from Ms. Song Q. Hi, hello, okay. So, um, she said, Hi, Professor Hiraishi, thanks for the insightful knowledge sharing. I would like to ask if you may want to share what is your recent research project about. And what books are you reading recently that are a blessing for the twelve minds? Thank you. Yeah, say again. Uh, my my recent uh, recent uh, research project about. So, what is your recent recent research project about? The current. So, yeah, the current one, the one that well, you're I mean, still working on recently. Uh, well, I mean, um, what I'm now doing is far removed from Indonesia. I'm now okay. looking at security and technology. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, semiconductors, uh, AI, robots, and so oh, okay. on. <laughs> so it's a very different topic. Uh, mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, um, uh, about two years ago, I finished the sequel to Daman Burgurak. Mm -hmm. uh, with the title The Phantom World of Diko and it is actually uh, I, I'm revisiting uh, the, the Dutch Indies and mm -hmm. Prograkan especially in the late 1920s and 1930s about, you know, I mean for example Iwakus Masmantri uh, Tambalaka, Pari uh, Musol Speka E, Sukano, mm -hmm. Hata, uh, Garindo, I mean, Garin, uh, and so on. So, and of course, Digo. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, actually, that one is you know, probably uh, some of you, especially those who have read my first book, might find of some interest. Okay. So, looking forward to reading the sequel. 
Um, yeah. So, and what books are you reading recently that are a blessing for entertainment? So probably like the newest book that you just finished recently? Um, you know, I mean, uh, I read not just English books. I read a mm. lot of Japanese, Japanese books. books. Right? Yeah. So um, I'm hard pressed uh, which English books I would recommend. Um, yeah, maybe this is a bit strange, but uh, I recently read a book about uh, Darwinism and the what is life is a title mm -hmm. okay uh, yeah that is actually quite good okay so and the other the other one is the kill chain it's mm -hmm. actually the war in the 21st the, about the future war about mm -hmm. the war in the 21st century and how emerging technologies are changing our notion of war itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So actually, now you know. I mean, I'm far removed. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, Miss Sangyu, there you got two more recommendation of books. Uh, okay. Um, so next one is from Miss Nisa Alfira. Hi, Miss Nisa. Um, so she asks, "Hi, Professor." Okay. So uh, do you want to ask it by yourself? Or do you want me to read it? Yeah. Yes, okay, you uh, can, I would like. Yeah, uh, thank you for the, the opportunity. Uh, hello, professor. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I would like to ask you uh, if you may uh, share with us about the history of uh, the books that tell us tell us about the history of uh, presidential uh, studies or presidential management in Indonesia, because I'm curious about. Uh, how Indonesian uh, presidency was managed uh, time after time uh, as you have uh, told us about one book that shared uh, about the presidential uh, yeah the president the presidency in uh, the US uh, right now I want to ask you uh, about that uh, kind of same books uh, that tell us about uh, Indonesian presidency. Well, actually, yeah, well, thank you. I mean, uh, that is precisely the reason I'm sort of suggesting some of you read that book and ask similar question and work on Indonesian uh, presidential politics. Because, you know, I mean, actually, um, I read, I mean, for example, um, SBE's book or Pahabibi's uh, memoirs and so on. But um, as far as I can tell, uh, I haven't really read any good book to make me understand how um, a series of decisions were made and, uh, for example, uh, President Habibi. Uh, so I would really encourage some of you to work on this topic. I mean, if if I know, you know, I I I, I would recommend. But you know, as far as I can tell, uh, I just don't see any book which is as good as the book I mentioned uh, about American presidential politics. Thank you very much, Professor. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other question? Anybody want to have another question? If um, there is no other questions, then maybe we can proceed to the next uh, agenda, which would be uh, photo session, okay. Is that it, Winton? Hi, Erwinton. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I have one question. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, if I'm not mistaken, you graduated from Cornell University, right? Yeah. 
probably you know Daniel Dakidai. Yes. Yeah, passed away recently. Yeah. 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 What do you think about him? Uh, his, his actually his his work. I mean, uh, about journalism and state control. I mean, state censor censorship is a very good book. I mean, uh, I didn't work with Daniel. Uh, he's older than me, but he came uh, when I was already teaching at Cornell, and he worked with Ben Anderson, and um, very hardworking. Uh, and you know, I mean, I read his dissertation, which was very good. Yeah. Thank you. But you know, I mean, actually, again. His dissertation tells more about new order Indonesia. Thank you. Mm. All right. Do you have another question still? We still got quite some time, actually. Okay. So should we proceed to the next agenda? Minton? Okay. Uh, bisa okay. Yeah, okay. So um, maybe we can all try to open our camera and we're going to have a photo session, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Minton, can you take a screenshot? Okay, yeah. So everybody, we're going to have a photo session here with Professor Takashi Shiraisi, or if mm -hmm. I may call you um, Takashi Sensei. Yeah. Would that be okay? <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you can start the full session now. Okay. Okay. Okay, first slide. How many slides do we have? Okay. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, as we are nearing to the end of our session today, I would like in closing to say thank you very much for taking the time of your schedule and join mm -hmm. us today. Uh, hopefully, you all enjoy our session and um, you should, um, hopefully you can also read the books that we just got a recommendation of from uh, <laughs> Professor Takashi Shireshi. And also, again, for Professor Takashi Shireshi, thank you for the fruitful and engaging uh, recommendation and discussion. And we really look forward to have you in our next event. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, thank you, everyone, once again, and have a nice day. Bye bye. Okay. You thank you all. very much for inviting thank me. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Salam. <laughs> Terima kasih. Minton masih di sini. Ya. Hai, hai. Should we close? Ya, yeah, if you wish to. Oke. Okay. Tuh, alat menangkatnya. Ternyata jam 10 udah selesai.